Hi, I'm Peggy Sue Skipper, and we are fresh off the Unearthing Ancient Civilizations Conference. It was right here in Houston, Texas. And I'm delighted to have with me today one of the experts that spoke at that conference. Stick with us, you're going to love this. Hi, and welcome to the show. I'm Peggy Sue Skipper, and one of my passions is ancient sites. I think they have things to tell us that we haven't even begun to uncover yet. And I'm delighted to have with me today a man who has been studying ancient sites for many years and is the author of two very well-known books. We're going to be talking to Mr. Christopher Dunn today. Welcome, Chris. Thank you. It's glad to be here. So you've been studying ancient sites for how long? Uh, 34 years. Oh, a long time. Okay. Yeah. And you're actually an engineer by mm -hmm. profession, right? A manufacturing engineer. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that seems sort of incongruous a bit to me. How do you reconcile being an engineer with studying sites that were created so long ago that engineering maybe wasn't what it is today, right? Um, that's a good question. Uh, normally when you look at ancient sites, you think of people who are um, fairly simple. They use simple indigenous. tools. Indigenous people and uh, not not certainly not of the engineering quality that we have uh, in modern days. But what I found was that even going back as, uh, to the early 1900s, engineers were fascinated with the Great Pyramid in Egypt and they were writing about it, studying it, documenting it. Uh, in 1883, uh, William Flinders Petrie published a book, uh, Pyramids and Temples of Giza. And he's the first uh, Egyptologist, or at least the first to actually go there and systemati systematically document uh, what he found in Egypt. Well, he was a surveyor. His father was an engineer, and he consulted with engineers as he did his studies. So his, his work is very, very interesting. And I picked up on some of, the, some of his writings and expanded on, the, on that. Plus, the uh, focus on the Great Pyramid while we may think that it doesn't relate to engineering, it is nothing but engineering. Okay. And you know, That's when you <laughs> when you look like at how did that happen, right? <clears throat> right, because of the precision, the geometries, um, just the just the act of actually building the Great Pyramid, you would engage engineers, you would engage art, uh, architects. There probably wasn't any Egyptologists working on, on uh, the Great Pyramid when it was built because Egyptology didn't start up until the 1880s, so. <laughs> uh, not likely. So there, you, would, you would have found engineers on site, not, not the archeologists or Egyptologists when the pyramid was built. So the relevance is definitely uh, related to engineering. You know, I, I find that interesting because as I've gotten <clears throat> more familiar with ancient sites, I find that engineers are really fascinated with these things. You think that that's kind of a different science from studying ancient civilizations. And yet, you being an engineer, I mean, you've been to these sites, you've actually measured things, mm -hmm. and you would say that this is quite an engineering feat, right? Oh, exactly, because uh, to engineers, measurements is uh, the stock and trade, precision, measurements. If you're not measuring something as an engineer, then you're not doing your job. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, going to Egypt over the last uh, 30 years, I've been taking instruments to you know, uh, measure some artifacts that are accessible to me. More recently, uh, using digital photography and then uh, computer-aided design software to uh, analyze particular pieces. And what I found was that, uh, as you said, you know, engineers are now are going to Egypt. And as an engineer, I can say all the engineers that I go with are awed, are humbled by what they what they see. The it's accomplishments like, wow. of How the How did they ancients. do this back then when they were right. supposedly indigenous or primitive people? <coughs> <coughs> yes, and uh, and I I talk to Egyptologists who are leading tours in, in Egypt, and they say, you know, Chris, uh, I love talking to engineers because I, I, every time I, I have an engineer in my group, I cannot actually talk about the Egyptologists. Uh, theories on how things are built. They dismiss them completely <laughs> and start to talk about uh, practical ways that they can they, that they can build. Uh, but the the conventional theories uh, just don't hold up. Okay. And you know the study that I have done 
with respect to geometry and precision, particularly the, the pyramids, the, the, uh, the statuary, uh, and some of the other architectural elements that you find on the Giza Plateau or in the temples uh, in, the, in the south. They uh, speak of a much higher level of technology uh, in, in ancient history than what we have given them credit for. And then I have to ask you, what does that do to your engineer mind? <laughs> I mean, does that create, <laughs> does that create some difficulty there in, in, in reconciling how these may have been built and what they are today? And um, Actually, it's very stimulating to an engineer's mind to, to go there and puzzle over how they may have accomplished these feats. Um, it is kind of mind-blowing in a way. I think that uh, as, as far as a, uh, a, a, a trip or a, you know traveling or go, a destination, uh, Egypt for an engineer would be kind of like the mecca uh, for engineers because it ha it has so much to offer that would resonate with them. Not just you know on both sides of the brain you have the right and left brain and. You know, you f I find myself banging on both sides, you yeah, know, right. <laughs> because it, it's well, not... it's about finding <laughs> that balance, right? <laughs> right, it's, uh, yeah, and yeah. It, it is, really, because the, uh, it is uh, ex mind-expanding in a way, because you do, you have the, not just the, uh, the engineering um, f uh, facet, you also have the, the more spiritual, which uh, is also Im imparted on, on the brain as you, as you experience the, the temples. If you open yourself up, Right. If you do it with an open heart and an open mind. Right. And I think you just hit on what, what I believe is the key to discovering what these sites have to tell us. I do think they have information for us, information that will help us understand ourselves better historically yeah. and also perhaps help us formulate a new and better future. That, that's what I think is the exciting thing about studying ancient sites. Yeah. So well, and what, what I have... Uh, uh, sort of in tune with my studies is that if we are able to replicate or if we're able to understand how the ancient Egyptians engineered their their society and really what we're looking at is just the skeleton of the society so we're looking at the bare bones you know the just the stones everything else is gone but if we're able to put clothes on on the skeleton or flesh and blood it will be it look a lot different than what we have been presented in history books right. uh, because it would uh, show a civilization that was much more advanced they had more advanced tools um, uh, the products that they made are, are very advanced in their in their sophistication and to say that over a 3000 year period the ancient egyptians could conceive of these incredible products uh, uh, you know these uh, this mega engineering it's engineering on a massive scale and they would they did it just with using simple tools uh, it does not theoretically theoretically i mean uh, yes uh, uh, yeah you're right absolutely that uh, everything is theory in right. terms of analyzing the ancient egyptians because nobody knows we they theorize and the th the uh, the tools are no longer in the archaeological oh they haven't been found in the archaeological record so Archaeologists and Egyptologists limit themselves to what they find in the archaeological record or what the, the history books uh, tell them was available to this ancient culture. Engineers are not restricted like that. We think of, try to think of more practical ways to accomplish the work. Well, I think that's interesting. And uh, we're just coming off of yesterday a conference, the Unearthing Ancient Civilizations Conference, which you were a speaker at. And... Um, I think one of the things that you said in the panel discussion really caught my attention, um, and that was that Egypt needs to um, have its true history. Mm -hmm. Could you expand on that a little bit? Because I think that's a very, I think that's a very profound statement. What did you mean by that? Well, the uh, the history of Egypt has been written by uh, Westerners for the most part. You know, the, um, the uh, Egyptologists, early Egyptologists, were from England, from France, from Germany, and then from America. So much of, his, much of the, uh, the history that is taught about ancient Egypt was written not by Egyptians, but by Westerners. And, the, uh, and then those works were handed back to the Egyptians who uh, 
said, okay, you know, and they started to teach it in their universities. And the, uh, I, I think that the, the Egyptians, particularly their engineering minds, architectural minds, and the, we do find that there is now uh, a group of technocrats or people who have technical um, backgrounds in Egypt who are, who are looking at these ancient sites in a different way. And I think if, well, if they knew, if they knew what I have uncovered, uh, and they were they started to follow my foot tracks through Egypt and started to do their own measures, they would they would rewrite their their own history. Okay, um, and one other thing that you said was that the tools haven't been found, and that's pretty much true with all pyramids around the world, right? We've mm -hmm. never really found yeah. the tools that helped, that created these pyramids, yeah, which, is, right. which is kind of interesting in itself, right? Right, I mean, it, why are you gonna look for them? I mean, that's the question that came up uh, in, in the conference yesterday. Uh, where would you go look for them or find them? I don't know. Where, where are the tools that built the Hoover Dam? Uh, all the tools that, Good you point. know, manufactured the camera uh, in, this, in this studio. I mean, the tools, ex uh, the tools exist, or we know they exist, because we know the kind of tools that it takes to create these things. Um, but we've never seen them. Okay. <coughs> it does seem odd, though. It seems like in any culture, I mean, you look at uh, even Native American cultures, you know, you go to digs and you find the spearheads, or you find, you, you <coughs> find traces of tools. Mm -hmm. And it yeah. seems to me like that there would be some trace of a tool somewhere at some pyramid. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think that's where you actually start to consider more seriously um, the time period when the, when the pyramids and the temples were built because of the, the time that it would uh, be necessary for uh, materials to degrade or, you know, to erode and just blow away. Mm. There, my personal opinion is, is that there was a massive change, earth changes in the past, and that the, uh, that the tools are buried under the sea somewhere or under the sand in the Sahara, we don't know, or they, those that were left uh, above ground were uh, eroded, were carried away, were, uh, used for other purposes. Um, but just, the, just a few thousand years would, would see any metals or ferrous materials erode. Uh, there's, there was a, um, a show on television called Life After People mm -hmm. that showed I, I heard that. that, yeah, uh, if, if people were taken off the planet, how soon our, our civilization, what we have, would actually be absorbed into, into the, uh, the planet's... Everything but the styrofoam, right? <laughs> yeah. Forever. Well, you know, that's so. another thing, <clears throat> the styrofoam. Um, we don't know what kind of materials they had in ancient <laughs> Egypt. And, you know, somebody, uh, you know, facetiously said, well, you know, we don't find any styrofoam cups. So, well, how do we know we had, they had styrofoam cups? You know, they probably didn't. Or toaster ovens or, what you know, other products that we use today. Um, we don't know. I mean, there's so much that there was lost. Okay, we're going to take a break in just a second and then come back and I want to talk about your two books, uh, okay. Giza Power, which, was, uh, which came out when? That was uh, 1998. 1998. And then your latest book, um, mm -hmm. Lost Technologies of Ancient Egypt, which, which we have a copy of here, mm -hmm. and we'll discuss that in the next half. Okay. Okay, stick with us. We'll be right back with Christopher Dunn. Mm -hmm. 